All right, I wanna welcome everybody tonight to our first presentation in our series called Start Here. Um, we just want to share with you and build up our Valor families and our friends and just you know really help explore how we can help develop your family. So there are four parts of the series. Today, you get to hear from Awkward to Awesome from our middle school lead, Carrie Donaldson, to actually our secondary lead, I apologize, because she's incredible herself. And then next week, we've got Michelle Trelecki is going to be sharing on bringing elementary science into your elementary home. Um, after that, we've got the lovely Mindy Harden. He's going to talk about technology use with your family. And the following week, we have Leslie Adams, who's going to be sharing with like how to prepare your high school student each year of the journey for what happens after high school. Now, if you are not familiar with Valor, we just want to share for a second. Valor is what we call it's a thing that we started five years ago, one-to-one. -one. So every student tuition pays for another student to go to school internationally. So we have partners in Kenya, Haiti, the Philippines, and Guatemala. We're really excited about that and adding those partners there. And our students are connected with them. Like I say it, we're Valor Nation, but we mean that. We are Valor Nation. We've got this giant global perspective, and we really care about developing students so that they can have impact on the world. So the first part about that is Carrie is going to talk about literally my favorite group of students, middle schoolers. I love them. They are wonderful, and God made them so fantastically. So Carrie, I'm going to give it away. All right. Thank you, Holly. Um, all right, I have some slides here, so I'm going to share my screen with you all. All right, there we are. Um, all right, well, like Holly said, my name is Carrie Donaldson. For those of you who do not know me, um, I'm our sixth grade core teacher. Um, so I teach sixth grade English, history, um, Bible, and I did a little bit of math this year as well. Um, I'm also our secondary lead and I absolutely love middle school. Um, most people think that I'm a little bit crazy for it, but there's something about walking with students in times of transition and newness that's both really humbling and really awe-inspiring to watch. Um, so a little bit about me. I earned my master's degree in higher education and student administration from the University of Portland in 2018. Um, and while the concentration of my degree was focused more on college students, I found that there's so much overlap um, between college students and middle school students when it comes to student development theories. And this is because both middle school and starting college are huge transitional periods in life um, where there's potential for an incredible amount of growth as a person. So before we get started talking about some of those theories, I would love for your participation in taking a quick little trip down memory lane with me. Uh, I want you to think about some of those transitional moments in middle school for you. Um, what was something silly that you did when you were in middle school? And I would love to have you either just like keep it in your brain or write it down on a scratch piece of paper. And after you have that, take a moment to write down why you did that silly thing. Um, I will be sharing <laughs> a silly story myself. Um, but I'd love to ask, and I know there's just a few of us in here, so hopefully it's not too intimidating, um, but if anybody's willing to share, I would love to hear some of your silly middle school stories. Um, so we're just going to take a couple minutes to get our thoughts going, and then I'm going to see if we have any brave volunteers here. So something silly you did in middle school, and why you think you did that silly thing. I love seeing some of your faces as you're thinking about these things. Some giggles to yourself or cringes. <laughs> I 
All right, is there anybody who would be willing to share something silly that happened to them in middle school? Yeah, Colby. I'll share. I don't know how silly it was, but in eighth grade, um, actually the day of last day of eighth grade, I decided it would be a really great idea to jump down our middle school steps. It was like a set of like four or five steps. Um, I'm not graceful to begin with. So, you know, I did. And um, actually, I sprayed my ankle. So I walked eighth grade promotion with a huge bandage and ankle. But I think I did it because I thought I was invincible. Mm -hmm. So. Absolutely. Anybody else? It's okay if not. I can share when Mrs. Donaldson. Oh, I'd love that. So, well, I mean, it's Holly Neal, so I obviously, you know, think that I know everything and I thought I knew how to cut my hair. And so I cut my hair and I cut my bangs and I did that by holding my hair down when it was dry and cutting it. And then I didn't cut it right. So I had to pull more hair down and cut it again. And then I didn't do it right. And so I ended up with bangs, like seriously, like an inch thick sticking out from the front of my forehead and all of my hair towards the front of my head. <clears throat> There's pictures somewhere. I, did, I think I burned them all, but there might still be some pictures somewhere. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Wonderful. The times of middle school. Uh, so let me share with you um, a silly story. One of the first ones that came to my head when I was thinking about this. Um, this is a picture of middle school Carrie. I think that this was my sixth grade picture. May have been seven. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but when I was in seventh grade, I thought that wearing jingle bells tied to my shoelaces at Christmas time was the best idea since sliced bread. Um, it was going to be festive and fun and I was going to stand out. Every middle schooler's dream, right? Um, and after about 10 minutes into the school day, everyone was going insane, including me. Like I hated the sound, everybody was going crazy and everybody was so cranky because of my jingle bells all tied to my shoes but I was committed and I made this decision and I was going to stick to it for better or for worse. Um, why? Because I thought when you made up your mind about something, you followed through and I thought that I was being funny. <laughs> that was my purpose. Um, and I had made it to about lunchtime and I remember that just after lunch, I had seventh grade Spanish class. And there's something about this moment where I vividly remember the setup of the classroom. And all the tables were in a U shape. And I was sitting there and I felt like everybody was staring at me, but it turns out that they were staring at the student who had crawled under the table to cut my shoelaces off of my shoes because of the jingle bells. And so that was the end of the jingle bells was, um, oh, his name was Colin. He had crawled under the table and cut them off because they were driving everybody insane. And I remember this feeling of being both really frustrated that Colin had taken away my festive Christmas jingle bells. And then also feeling relief because I didn't have to endure that sound anymore. And what happens when we have two opposing feelings in our brains? We have some cognitive dissonance. Like we're not entirely sure what's going on or how we're supposed to feel when we have two opposite feelings that are competing for our attention. And that's what's happening in our middle schoolers' brains constantly as they're facing new things, new thoughts, puberty, new pressures, and as their brains are developing. So, how then do we help them through the awkward jingle bells on shoes stages of life? I believe that to help our students navigate new awkward times, uh, we first need to understand how we can set our students up for the most growth possible. 
Um, and here on this slide, we have a diagram of Sanford's theory of challenge and support for student growth. And on the left side here of this diagram, we have low challenge. And the right side, we have high challenges. And then at the bottom, we have low support. The top, we have high support. And support can come in a variety of different ways to our students, but most commonly comes from adults that are in our students' lives. Um, so let's walk through this diagram um, real quick because I want to use it as a foundation as we dive into what the challenges our middle school students are facing and how we can better support them. Um, so first down here in the bottom left corner, um, we have low challenge and low support. And this point is where our students are not being challenged and they have little support at the same time. So low challenge and not a lot of support. And when our students are in this space, they're feeling apathetic and they're disengaged from what's going on. And that means that there's not a lot of learning or growth happening when our brains are not challenged and we're not engaged and people are not encouraging us to be engaged. Then in this top left box, we have low challenge, high support. And this is what we often call the comfort zone. Uh, this is when we have a huge support system, people who really care about us and they're there for us. And we're also not being challenged. This is one that often happens uh, in schoolwork for students when a student asks uh, a parent or an adult for help with, with an assignment when they actually know how to do it, uh, but they just want their parent or their adult to do the work for them. Um, this box of high support and low challenges is comfortable because we're not necessarily having to work for new things. But again, it's not providing the space for growth in our students that we would like to see. And then on the bottom right hand corner down here, we have a high amount of challenge and low support. And this box, when things are starting to get really tough for our students and they don't have a good support system in place. And when our students are feeling really challenged and they're not supported, this is when we see high amounts of stress and anxiety and difficulty in coping with those emotions. And so the most optimal box in Sanford's theory is high challenge and high support. And when students are engaged and having to work for their learning and information and problem solving while having an equal amount of support, this is where the most amount of growth and learning happens for our students. Uh, the most important thing to remember about the challenge and support theory here is that the amount of support we're offering a student should be equal to the level of the challenges that they're facing. And this is a difficult balance to find. It takes a lot of trial and error because every student's challenge level um, is a little bit different in different activities. Like a student um, who's really good at playing basketball, that might not be a as much of a challenge uh, for one student than another. And so the student who's already really good at playing basketball isn't going to need as much support as the student who's maybe struggling a little bit more in that area. And so everything here is a little bit of trial and error to find that right balance of, okay, where is this challenge at? And what kind of support do I need to be enough to even the playing field here, to not be too much and not to be too little. And as we continue through talking about some of the challenges that our students are facing, I want us to keep in mind Sanford's theory here of challenge and support. And I'm going to keep coming back to this um, and talking about providing support that matches the challenges that our students are facing. So to take a look 
at some of those challenges, um, I want to use the lens of Chickering's seven vectors of student development. Um, and we're only going to be talking through about four of them because if I was to talk about all seven vectors, I could keep you here for hours. <laughs> Uh, the four challenging stages of student development uh, that I think are really important to our middle school students are managing emotions, moving towards independence, developing purpose, and developing integrity. And I want to end with talking about developing purpose and integrity because I love how both of these stages of development really tie into and show our mission and vision of developing students at Valor. So let's start with emotions. You may be experiencing increased moodiness and less affection from your student at home. Most of this comes from the surge of hormones students are experiencing with puberty. Uh, but to help us all through the newfound attitudes, uh, we, as the support system to our students, need to be really clear in our expectations and goals for them. And when our expectations and our goals for our students are clear, there's a slightly less chance of a communication breakdown happening with our student. And so to help move our students to their optimal area of growth, when our challenge and support um, is at an equal balance, we need to allow space for our students to decide how they're going to meet our expectations and our goals for them. Um, an example of this could be at home, could be a conversation around keeping our bedrooms clean. Maybe your expectation is that um, your student needs to have their bedroom cleaned by every Friday night. And so then ask your student how they're going to get the task done. And when they share with you the steps for how they're going to meet the expectation, our support is following up on their action steps that they've chosen for themselves. So you're giving them some ownership in reaching those expectations and goals. Um, in my classroom, this often looks like having large assignments broken down into smaller sections. So it's like, okay, we're going to start writing essays. So first we're going to submit our essay topic, and then we're going to submit an outline for the essay. And then we're going to do peer editing and submit our editing marks, and then we'll submit our final draft. And in providing support through small, accomplishable steps, uh, our students are going to feel less overwhelmed by large expectations like, oh, cleaning my room, it's such a disaster, there's stuff everywhere. And this, the hope here is that this will help mitigate some of that moodiness that happens when students are feeling overwhelmed by things that might be hard or new or seem really big. And in speaking about new and hard things. Our students are beginning to feel more stress and anxiety from more challenging schoolwork. And as we grow in school, our work should be getting more difficult um, because we should be growing and learning and changing and challenging ourselves. But as we know from the challenge and support theory, the higher level of challenge means that there needs to be a higher level of support that matches. And the best thing that we can do for our students when they're feeling that heavy stress and heavy anxiety is to allow them to feel those things and then provide space for them to share how they're feeling. And I, I feel some tension when I say that. Um, through the Zoom screen of like, oh, allow them to like feel stressed and anxious. I just want to fix that. Because oftentimes our initial instinct as adults, when we see our students struggling with big emotions, is to try to fix it. But that moves us back to that comfort zone of our challenge and support theory, where there's less intentional growth happening. And we want to make sure that our students are in our optimal areas of growth. Our students really want to be listened to when they're feeling stressed and anxious. And a little bit later on, we're going to talk a little bit more about that listening piece. 
And so the last challenge about managing emotions that I want to talk about is how middle school students start to show more interest in their peer groups and start to become more influenced by the peers that they spend their time with. Uh, some of you might be noticing that in your students currently. These are the emotions of the, I need to wear my hair this way to be accepted, or I need to play soccer or I won't have any friends. The only way I will have friends is if I do say, act like X, Y, and Z. And as our students are becoming more aware of themselves, they're also becoming more aware of their peers and what their peers think of them. So, my suggestion in supporting our students through these big and tricky emotions is to meet and get to know your students' friends. Because as preteens sometimes go through phases of not wanting to hear what mom and dad have to say, they're still seeking the attention and advice of adults. So if you are getting to know your students' friends and pouring into them as an adult who is not their parent, you are directly impacting the influence of peers on your student. It's super cool. This is one of the reasons why I take my job as a middle school teacher so importantly, because I know that my words and actions as an adult will directly impact how students act around and towards each other. And so then let's move into another one of Chickering's developmental stages, moving towards independence. Um, our students are starting to develop a stronger sense of right and wrong. They're starting to get those gut feelings when something they say wasn't kind, but they didn't realize that it wasn't kind until it came out of their mouth. And it's too late, we can't eat our words back. Uh, this still happens to us as adults from time to time. And to match the challenge that comes with developing their sense of right and wrong, the support is to allow our students to fail. And again, I know that maybe talking about our students failing is something that causes us a little bit of anxiety and panic and makes our hearts, hearts race a little bit, and that's okay. Because every time we fail or make mistakes, we have the opportunity to learn and grow from them. So it's okay when your student forgets to turn in a really big class assignment. They're going to continue developing their sense of right and wrong. They'll learn that their grade is not what they want it to be if they turn in their big assignment late. Uh, and gradually they're building their personal responsibility and independence as long as they have the equal amount of support in it. It's our responsibility as adults in the lives of our students to help them fill their toolboxes of how to handle failures and successes and not to keep them in their comfort zone. So not hovering and making sure that our students are submitting their assignments on time every single time. We're like, us as teachers, we would love that. But we know that that's not what's going to be important for the growth of our students. Uh, we know that it's going to take some, um, some time for them to get used to what it's like to take ownership and responsibility for their education and for their schoolwork. And this applies to many other parts of their lives as well. And so I'm going to leave this allow students to fail part bolded here as we continue talking about moving towards independence because allowing our students to fail is one of the best things that we can do to help them in their journey to becoming independent people. And as our students are developing that sense of right and wrong, we're allowing them to fail. They're also developing the ability for more complex thoughts and the ability to solve problems on their own. It's both so hard and so humbling to watch 11 to 13 year olds try to solve a difficult problem on their own, whether that's in a friendship, a problem with a sibling, a homework problem. And this is difficult because we want our students to succeed and we want them to feel confident. And it's not fun to see our students struggling to solve a problem that we as, an, as adults 
um, see as a really easy fix or we know we have a solution to already. And the way we get our students succeeding and feeling confident is first to allow them to fail and then being there for them to listen to their emotions when they do and next to model time management and asking for help. Because as students begin to problem solve on their own, the more they will come to figure out that they can't do everything on their own. And comes one of the biggest challenges, even for us as adults, is asking for help. If we as adults are open with our students and practice asking for help and asking for things that we need at home, the more normal that becomes for our students to practice, which is really cool. Uh, in the classroom, I like to be really honest with my students and I share with them when I'm having an off day. And I tell them exactly what I need from them because I was having an off day. And then I let them know what I need from them is going to help me have a better day. At home, this could look something like, um, hey Sally, I had a really busy day at work and I have quite the bad headache. I know that it's not your night to wash the dishes, but would you please help me out by washing them? It would really help me to feel better today. And if asking for help and then explaining why we need it is new language, it could ensue some extra attitude and moodiness, but it takes practice and trial and error for what works best for your family. And so then as our middle schoolers are becoming more independent and they're better able to also express thoughts and feelings verbally. Okay, they're able to say things like, oh, I need help with this. And there's still the huff and the puff and the tears without words. Don't get me wrong, that still happens to me as an adult on occasion as well. But we can support our students by helping them set goals for how they're going to express their thoughts and their feelings. Uh, one of the best examples that I have of a student expressing their thoughts and feelings verbally um, happened earlier this year. And so I want to share just a quick story. Uh, I had a student who came back to the classroom a few minutes before the rest of the class after lunch and they looked a little bit upset. I could tell like the rest of the class still wasn't there yet and so I asked them like, hey, how are you feeling right now? And after some silent time of staring at the floor, <laughs> they told me that time spent with their peers at lunch that day just felt hard and that they needed some space away from their peers to calm down for a minute because they were just feeling upset and like time spent with their peers was not a good place for them right now. Like what? That was absolutely incredible and showed me that that student is in their growth box. High challenge and high support. They had a big emotional challenge that they were facing and they felt like they had enough support to share with me their needs. And that was an incredible moment for me where I was like, wow, this is happening. Um, we are growing and we're learning. And our students often need that encouragement to express their thoughts and their feelings. So ask your student what they're feeling or thinking, but then prepare yourself to sit with them quietly. Uh, until they've done the brain work to put their thoughts and their feelings into words and voice what they need. And so lastly here, we're going to talk um, a little bit about developing purpose and integrity. 11 to 13 year olds are starting to become passionate little people. Uh, they're becoming passionate about spending time with their friends, about social issues, about their hobbies, about sports teams, so many different things. The list could go on and on. And it's so important that we're allowing and encouraging our students to try new things, even if that interest does not last long. Uh, even if we know their interest will not last long. This is also even important um, for adults to grow and learn. 
uh, for example, my husband and I once decided that we needed a new hobby and we both really enjoy and feel passionate about art type things. I'm a big craft person and he does photography and has quite the eye for design. So we thought that watercolor painting would be a really cool new hobby that we could do together for a long time. And so we got ourselves a cheap set of watercolor paints, a cheap set of brushes, and a small pack of watercolor paper. And we were set and we were ready to go. We spent some time browsing YouTube, finding ourselves a how-to watercolor paint video. And we settled on one that seemed not very challenging. It was like 30 minutes. We're like, okay, this is the one. We're going to do this. We're going to have a new hobby and we're going to be awesome at it. This did not go very well. We argued with each other the whole time because neither of us were satisfied with our watercolor painting ability. Uh, those watercolor paints are now in a box in the closet and that's okay because we pursued the passion in the moment and we, tr we tested it out. Um, it was something that did not last long, <laughs> but that's okay. And as our students are becoming passionate, right, we felt passionate about art, so we thought, oh, watercolor painting. Uh, as our students are feeling passionate, they're also discovering new interests. Maybe one of them will be the next famous watercolor painter, because I know it's not going to be me. And at Valor, it's part of our vision and mission as a school to help our students grow into the people that God is calling them to be. I have a banner in the back of one of our sixth grade classrooms that says, we are becoming. It's a reminder to me every day that I look at it, and hopefully to our students as well, that we're constantly in a state of becoming. We're never finished. As long as we're on this earth, we're still growing into the person that God's calling us to be. And we do get closer to God's purpose in our lives by pursuing the passions and the interests that he's placing on our hearts. In supporting our students in their passions and interests, we need to help remind them that God's gifted every person with individual sets of skills and, and gifts and that not everybody is gifted at the, with the same things. Uh, for example, watercolor painting, not a gift that I or my husband have, but we didn't know that until we explored it as an option. And this can be really difficult because in the developing brain of a middle school student, they want to be good at every new interest they try the first time that they try it. Hey, our patience isn't quite built yet. We don't have enough practice um, being patient with ourselves when we're trying new things when we're a middle school student. And so in supporting our students in their journey to find their purpose, we get to pour into their lives the truths and share God's truths and share with them that it isn't about how we accomplish or how we do not accomplish something, but it's why we're doing it, that it matters. We're blessed as adults in the lives of middle schoolers to be walking with our students in the midst of really challenging transitional times, um, the awkward years, if you will. The way we do this at Valor is through loving them and showing our students that God has uniquely designed each of them for his purpose and for his will. And we want our students to be children of God who are developing their purpose and their integrity that's completely centered in him. And us as adults get to pour into that. I mean, it's such a blessing and something that humbles me every single day that I work with middle schoolers, which is why I absolutely love this job and why I love having these kinds of conversations is how do we get our students to the place where they're seeking their identity in Christ? So I'd love to invite you to send me an email if you have any questions um, or you'd like to continue this conversation or even just to chit chat. Um, I love talking with you all. Um, 
yeah, that is what I have for you today on how we support our students in their times of transitions and all of the craziness that is middle school. So thank you so much. Yes. Um, so going back to when you were doing the charts that said like the high stress versus high encouragement or help, one of the things that we struggle with over at our house is that like what we feel like is encouragement to specifically our 13 year old to them just feels like interference <laughs> so <laughs> that is probably my biggest challenge is to remember like that i'm that that it's not going to look the same for him and just trying to figure out like what that means for him so is that kind of in line with that of where the encouragement's not necessarily going to be what I think it is, is it more like a love language thing where like figuring out for that kid or is it keeping consistent? Definitely. I think trial and error, trial and error. And so sometimes like our way of encouraging is like checking in and wanting to have conversations when our students need of encouragement is just to like listen to them. Um, and so it's all trial and error for some students. It might be listening. For other students, it might be like, nope, um, mom, I need you to make me a to-do list and make sure that I'm checking off everything on my to-do list. <laughs> and other students, encouragement might be like, oh, I'm going to give you the freedom to make those decisions. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I wanna add to that, Carrie. Um, mm -hmm. With middle schoolers, when you talk to them, you guys are doing a great job as parenting, by the way. It's it's hard. It, it's, it is hard. Mm -hmm. And you're doing a great job because they're amazing human beings. But with middle schoolers, a lot of those feelings come from a sense of, I don't know what to do next. I'm feeling kind of lost. And so they, they really want someone to listen to them, not problem solve. <laughs> you know, and that's my Achilles. So I love problem solving, but like with middle schoolers, they want the space to have someone to listen to them and they want the space to make some of their own decisions. So it's working on how do I provide a safety net for my middle schooler to let them make their decisions. Like guys, I encourage you ask your kid, Hey, what do you want for dinner tonight? Would you like to make it with the family? Hey, do you want to do this for us? Or is there something that I can have you do that you would like to do, like as part of our family, allow them to make choices and ask them about ways they can contribute. Because I'm telling you right now on our campus, if I go into the seventh grade and eighth grade room, and I'm like, all right, guys, I'm stuck on X, Y, Z. I am stuck on what we should do for prizes. What should I do for prizes for readathon? It might take a while to navigate the conversation, but they'll come up with amazing ideas and honestly things that inspire me to go above and beyond what we originally planned. And all it took was listening and asking what they wanted to do. Yeah, absolutely. Is there time for one more question? Sure. <laughs> okay, I'm like, I'm in the throes of this right now. And like, I am actually starting the process of becoming a love and logic, like facilitator. And I tell you what, I feel real good about elementary school, but this teenage stuff is like, it's hard. <laughs> Um, so the, the the other challenge that I'm facing, and I'm I'm seeing when you're talking about this, where this is coming out, is the I don't care, like the lack of empathy, and not necessarily about people, like a lot of people stuff like that, but like I don't care if I don't do fifteen problems when it's asking me to do sixteen problems, like I I don't care about that. Like, it's not going to really affect me. Like, is that a lack of, like, encouragement or do I need to let him, I'm pretty good at natural consequences, but like, am I not letting him fall far enough and hard enough? <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, Not always, but a lot of the times we see the apathetic attitudes when our students aren't being challenged. Um, and I think sometimes that that's like a hard concept to grasp. It's not always like sometimes our students just feel apathetic and like that's okay because they're growing and changing and becoming little people. Um, but a lot of times it comes from 
not being challenged. The task at hand might be challenging, but like overall, like what else is going on in our lives? Like, are we just content? Are we growing? Um, what are the other like stimulating brain factors that are going on? Like, how can I provide like engaging brain material to keep you engaged so that we're not feeling apathetic? And again, this is like all, every single student is different. Like every kid uh, is made uniquely them. And so um, it could just be like a teenage phase um, or it could be that they're not feeling challenged. And then it comes down to like listening to our student. Like, okay, like this is what's going on. You're telling me that you're feeling like you don't care why. Like what's the why? Um, I think, um, Mindy, I think it's you. You do a really wonderful job of like asking your kids why all the time. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you making the decision that you are? And then being open and willing to like sit in the awkward discomfort of the silence for a little bit while they chew on that question to come up with a response. It's funny that you say that I had a situation today where a kiddo described to me some schoolwork that they just didn't do. And I, I, they, then they told their teacher, like, I don't know how to do this. I'm not going to do it. And I was like, okay. And I wanted to be here specifically to say thank you to the Valor staff, because having launched a kiddo out of Valor and have another one in Valor, the way that, um, I am a very like hands off, talk to your teacher. I, I kind of always take the motto of if I need to get involved, um, I either A, ask permission from my child to reach out to their teacher or B, I wait for the teacher. <laughs> and this situation that came up today was a kiddo that was just kind of like, I just, I don't, I just didn't do it. And I told my teacher and they said, okay, we'll work it out. And it's taken me a few hours to sit with it and go, you just didn't do it? Like, wait a minute. And I didn't hear from your teacher and well, okay, how are you going to do it better? And how did we get to this problem? And I really just had to leave it in their hands of, I have talked to my teacher and I, and I haven't heard from the teacher. So, and, but I love that about Valor because I know that that comes top down and through you, Carrie and Holly and all of the teachers that my kids have experienced, like I see them work so hard to grow a relationship with that particular child and recognize that running to mom or running to dad doesn't teach them the, the skills that they need to be on their own and run, you know, first to God and then to themselves and their tools. And I've just always appreciated the way that you have struggled with me, all, all of the staff at Valor in that space. Um, so yeah, I, I did. I had even just today, there was a like, okay, so you just didn't do it and it's not done. And so it's late. And my, my parental radar was like, ah, <laughs> but I guess he's going to figure it out <laughs> with the teacher because I haven't heard from the teacher and I haven't been empowered to go help. So, um, it's a really uncomfortable space. And so now I'm just going to sit and wait and check Schoology every time I get the email, <laughs> see if his grade went up or down. <laughs> I don't know what else to do at this point. <laughs> so thank you for the way that you guys meet our kids where they are. Um, and just, I just have so loved it about Valor over and over again. Oh, I didn't really mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> oh, she spoke up well. But I just, like, that's something that, um, like, Mindy's kids talk about at school. Like, oh yeah, like, my mom asks me why all the time. Like, Mrs. Donaldson, why are you asking me why? My mom does that at home. I'm like, oh, good. I'm so glad. So do you just, like, sit there? Like, like is there a time limit that you sit there, like, after the why? <laughs> like, forevermore, wait until they say something? Yeah. No, wait a long time, Alicia. It, like, and it's part of that relationship thing. It, like, we're adults, and so we've built up this really high retention, and our lives move at a different speed than our sweet little munchkins wait a long time and honestly even if you're just sitting there hanging out with them waiting that's investing so much into their life they know and they see it and even if they choose that they're not ready quite yet to have the, like conversations just sitting there and waiting is enough 
Well, and that's more my challenge is he'll come back with something sassy, right? Like and not an actual answer. And then so like <laughs> I became a four-year-old, like, why? 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 <laughs> no, you just just sit there and wait. And, and, and like the thing to remember is as adults is we've already built our toolbox and we're used to moving at a pretty quick speed. And these guys, they, their toolbox is empty. Like they might have one or two things. It just takes a little bit different, a little longer. They need time to understand and experience new things. I liked what Mindy was saying about, wait, you just didn't do an assignment and I'm checking Schoology. Our, our society moves such at a faster speed now, right? Like you get an automatic update of what your kid's homework is and what they did and didn't do. And I think that does you a disservice because it's okay if they don't do something. It's, I give you permission right now. I'm a math teacher and a science teacher. It's okay if your kid doesn't do an assignment every once in a while. Their life will go on and they will still probably pass the class. And honestly, t- don't tell the kiddos. I did not have a four point. (laughs) And you know what? I also, one of the best things my mom ever did is we used to skip days at high school and we would have mommy daughter dates and she'd take me around and she'd show me the world and tell me about how God made me perfect. So, and it was just spending the time and waiting. The teachers will reach out if we see a big problem and the teachers will be really clear at saying, oh man, you know what? This was a big thing. Can you help me help them understand how we can work better on that? But it's, again, don't sweat the small stuff. They need to build up resilience and and work on their tools. All right, do we have any more? It's almost eight o'clock. And I'm just gonna, we can cut this. Any more questions from anyone for Miss Carey, our resident amazing middle school whisperer? I love this stuff. So if you ever want to shoot me an email, let me know. Thank yeah. you, Martha. Let me know to email me. <laughs> yeah, you can just you can just email Carrie. No, you guys, your kids are fabulous and they're wonderfully made and they're incredible. And I tell you right now, the things that we see are it's we're we're seeing the world changers. And yes, they might give you some sass. But you know what? We don't really see that as their teachers and the other adults in their lives. You know what we see? We see parents have poured into their lives. We've seen the kids that take that and they're listening and they're watching and they're trying to apply it. And again, somebody told me this. Uh, we were talking about because I have a four-year-old daughter and they're like, you know, you just figure out potty training, right? Like it just happens. It might be a little slower for some kids, but usually it just happens. It's very rare you've got a kid in high school who doesn't potty train. It's the same thing with middle school, right? You know, it's hard. It's frustrating. They're giving you all these attitudes. You're like, it's going to be this way forever. But you know what? It's very rare that you still are like, ask your parents, do you flip your parents the same middle school attitude that you had when you were 14? No, right? You've learned the skills. You've grown. You've figured it out. So it's just a phase that you get to be a part of and help grow them and love them through. And it's really fun. I like this age, man. They get my sass. I love them. (laughs) I love love them too. All right. Well, thank you guys for tonight and coming. God bless you. Next week, we're going to hear from Michelle about science. Carrie, you did an amazing job. God bless you as well. Thank you for being here tonight and leading this conversation. All right. Thanks guys. Bye.